if not now, when? If we're not going to invest in our parks as critical city infrastructure, we invest in utilities, we invest in transportation, education, all these other things. If COVID hasn't taught us that open space is critical city infrastructure, I don't know (laughs) what we've learned after all this. It's time to change the world. It's time for something better. We're telling the stories of people who are changing the world and how you can help. Our daily actions have a massive impact. So what will we do about it? We can remake the world. Because guess what? We can. Hi everyone, I'm Nathan Gardner and this is We Can Remake the World, a podcast about people who are changing the world and how you can help. Here's the good news for today, which is how we start every episode. Our first piece of good news continues a theme from our last episode, where we shared the story of a man in France who used almost all of his 200 million euros in lottery winnings to create a nonprofit focused on preserving rainforests in West Africa, native French forests, and to provide funds to support family caregivers for ill and aging family members. Today, we'll go to Ireland to highlight a couple, Francis and Patrick Connolly, who have already given away more than half of the 115 million British pounds, or around $142 million, that they won in the same lottery as the man in France, the Euro Millions jackpot, this time back in 2019. After using some of the money to purchase a new home for themselves on a beautiful piece of land in Northern Ireland, and then setting some aside to give away to family and friends, including their 17 nieces and nephews, the Northern Irish couple set up two charitable foundations. One of the foundations that they set up was named after Francis's mother, which focuses on supporting and growing local community service-driven projects. People can apply to be funded or to receive support within the local community. The focus of those projects varies widely, but all local. The other foundation works to support the elderly, young people who are looking to find work and own their own homes, and refugees, also in Northern Ireland. Listen to Frances describe why she's chosen to take what she's been given and help others. Because we, you know, you have those conversations about what would you do if you won the lottery. My first thing is always, who am I going to help? I get to change people's lives every day if I want to. If you're feeling down, helping other people and doing something to help other people will lift you. And two, if you can, giving to other people, whether it's time or money or whatever, it's really important. And it gives you a buzz and it's, it's, it's addictive. I'm addicted to it now. Wouldn't it be amazing if every Euro Millions jackpot winner decided to set aside at least half of their winnings to support others and support the earth? Or if jackpot winners all over the world decided to do that? Imagine how much positive change could happen. For our next piece of good news, we'll go to Missouri, where an 83-year-old woman is completing a Tough Mudder, mud-inspired 5K to raise money for freshwater well drilling in Africa for small villages there. On May 1st, earlier this month, Muddy Mildred Wilson, as she's now come to be known, completed her third Tough Mudder which is a global race that's packed with obstacles and takes place in the mud. People come out of it looking like creatures from the Black Lagoon, just full of mud from head to toe. And Muddy Mildred completed her third this year. She's still raising money to reach her goal of $5,000 to give to her son's organization who is funding the drilling of the wells in Africa. We'll post a link to Mildred's GoFundMe page on today's episode page if you'd like to contribute yourself to her goal. 83 years old, and not only completing a 5k through a bunch of mud and obstacles, but also using it as an opportunity to serve others. And our final piece of good news today comes from both the US and the UK, where a new annual tradition of letting your lawn overgrow has taken shape to support local bee populations. No Mo May was born in the United Kingdom. The idea was that people could let their lawns overgrow not mowing the lawn, not trimming any weeds, because often wildflowers grow amongst the tall grasses and weeds, which serves bees and other pollinators. And now, No Mow May is a growing initiative in the United States, which is being led by the Xerces Society, 
a nonprofit conservation society named after the Xerxes blue butterfly, which was a Northern California butterfly species native to the United States and the first butterfly species to go extinct due to human activity. This society works to preserve life of invertebrates across the world, but especially in North America. As home and landowners allow their lawns to overgrow for the full month, wildflowers like dandelions, clover, and violets, and others which bees love, grow and bloom during the early spring months when bees especially need abundant nutrition as they come out of winter hibernation. This is a huge help for the bees, who pollinate roughly 35% of the world's food supply especially during a time when pesticides, mass mosquito spraying, and other human activities are harming bee populations more daily, and during a time when we hear a lot of talk about food shortages more and more. And the great thing about this is, literally, by doing nothing, you help the bees. By not mowing your lawn, you offer your support. If you have a lawn and would like to participate, you can download a free sign to place on your overgrowing lawn from the Xerces Society website, which we'll post a link to on today's episode page. You don't just have to do it in May. I think doing this any time throughout the year where pollinators are out and about helps. If you place that sign on your front lawn, this will tell your neighbors why your grass is getting unusually long and maybe even inspire them to join you. Some communities, like Appleton, Wisconsin, and Edina, Minnesota, for example, have decided to participate as a full community. It's a full community-wide initiative to do No Mow May, suspending grass length and lawn care rules for the entire month. In addition to planting bee-friendly wildflowers, fruit trees, and building bee houses and avoiding toxic chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides, simply allowing your lawn to overgrow can make you a powerful ally to bees and other pollinators this year. And really, when we think about how much bees give to us, it's the least we can do, right? Which takes us nicely to our episode for today, where we'll explore all that nature does for us and the simple things that we can do in return. When I lived in New York City, nature saved me over and over. In a city like New York, where apartments are usually small and personal space is almost non-existent, whether you're inside or outside, being in a park, garden, or out by the water is a rare opportunity to get away and have some space. To experience less of the city noises, to slow down, to listen to the birds, or to hear your own thoughts and to find your sense of center again. I can't tell you how many times I escaped into nature, which really just meant going to a park, or the shore of the Hudson River, because it was close to where I used to live. I lived close to Manhattan's Fort Tryon Park, which is just north of the George Washington Bridge, in an area that most tourists and even most New Yorkers never visit. It's truly one of New York City's most beautiful parks, with a huge and beautifully kept garden and flower path where one of the highlights is every year the migration season of the monarch butterfly when thousands of monarchs descend on the flower garden to rest and refuel. I also used to see bald eagles, red-tailed hawks, brown eagles, and even wild owls in the neighborhood around Fort Tryon. Yes, I'm not kidding, bald eagles in New York City. In Manhattan, no less. Multiple times. I would go to Fort Tryon almost daily, when the weather was nice especially, to spend time alone or with my partner or our friends and neighbors, to take walks and talk, play games, picnic, hang a hammock, read, meditate, or just to chill out and clear my head. No exaggeration, this park kept me sane. I can't imagine what my life in New York would have been like without that park, without my relationship to a place that I could kind of call my own in a way, a little piece of privacy for me in a city where nothing is ever truly yours. A place without ambition or to-do lists or social calendars or work commitments, just a place to be still and appreciate something beautiful. But millions of people in New York City and in cities around the world do not have access to parks, green spaces, gardens. The New York Restoration Project, or NYRP for short, is changing that. Have you ever heard the term unsung hero? It refers to someone who's been doing humble hard work behind the scenes to support someone else or a whole group of people. 
who doesn't ask for thanks and usually doesn't get much attention for all that they do, but they keep on doing it anyway, out of love, out of generosity, or maybe out of service. In a city like New York that's full of nonprofits doing all kinds of amazing and inspiring work, NYRP is truly an unsung hero for the entire city. Every resident of New York owes a debt of gratitude to NYRP, whether they know it or not. NYRP has been turning abandoned lots and trash-filled parks into beautiful gardens and green spaces for decades. NYRP believes access to nature is a fundamental human right, and that all New Yorkers should be able to call somewhere green their own. Founded by multi-award-winning film and stage actress, songwriter and recording artist and author Bette Midler in 1995, NYRP has transformed dozens of trashed and underserved city parks and empty lots throughout New York into thriving havens of wildlife and calm and recreation through programs like trash collection, ecosystem rehabilitation, planting programs, urban gardening programs, community outreach and community education programs, and construction of actual green spaces out of nothing or out of empty lots. One of my favorite pizza shops in New York was in the West Village. It's called Two Boots Pizza, and they sell a slice inspired by Bette Midler. It's called the Earth Mother Slice, which, by the way, is delicious. And the name was obviously inspired because someone at Two Boots has been paying attention to Bette and NYRP's work to build and protect community gardens, community spaces that are outdoors, green spaces, parks, throughout all five boroughs of New York. I'm not sure if this is true for you, but I think many of us around the world rediscovered an appreciation for nature during the pandemic. Didn't you? I mean, I definitely did. When we can't go anywhere except a local park to get out of our houses and apartments, those familiar paths take on a new meaning. But so many urban residents did not have easy access to gardens, parks, and green spaces, and couldn't take advantage of a much-needed escape from the chaos and challenges of the last two years including families whose kids were at home, working mothers and fathers who just needed somewhere to go where their kids could play when playgrounds were closed, when schools were closed. NYRP sees this inequity in how our cities are set up regarding green spaces and nature as unacceptable, and their mission is to ensure that this becomes a thing of the past. Why does this matter in today's world? What importance does a community garden serve in the context of the global challenges in 2022? Well, we won't protect what we don't value. We won't value what we can't connect to. We can't connect to something we haven't seen, something nobody's given us access to. And we won't fight to protect the earth and nature in the same way if we've never seen the miracle of a plant growing from a tiny seed into something that gives us food or beauty. And so many people in cities and suburbs around the world never get the chance to experience that. Caring for our earth begins by recognizing what it is and what it offers to us in the first place. Organizations like NYRP are ensuring that children and adults in one of the most densely populated and concrete-heavy cities in the Western world don't miss out on building that connection, on establishing that relationship. As any of us who spent time in nature over the past two years during the difficulties of the pandemic I think would agree, when we care for nature, we get so much in return. NYRP offers us a model for bringing environmental justice, environmental equality, community renewal, and global respect for the earth into every apartment in every city, regardless of the size or cost of that apartment. It's not about how much you have or what you can afford. Every human being deserves to have equal rights to nature and to green spaces. And this work is planting seeds so that young people around the world understand what's at stake as we work to protect our planet, no matter where or how they grew up. So really excited to be joined today by Lynn Kelly, Executive Director of the New York Restoration Project, or NYRP for short. Thanks so much, Lynn. Really great to speak with you today. Thank you, Nathan. We appreciate being invited. This is very exciting. 
Yeah, good. Glad to hear it. We're we're really excited to speak with you as well. Um, so I really wanted to start with the core belief of NYRP, which is on the website, and I know in a lot of the messaging for the organization, which is really that nature itself is a fundamental human right, which I think is a powerful thing in a city like New York. So I'd love to hear you speak about sort of what's behind that core belief and how that plays out as far as what the organization does within the city of New York. Mm -hmm. Great question to start with. And I think it's because one assumes that everyone has access, equal access to nature, when in fact that is so not true. And that's why we reinforce it in our mission about nature being a fundamental right. Um, in New York City, access to green space is not yet equitable, right? <laughs> so New Yorkers use green space as their front yards, backyards, campsites, birthday <laughs> locations, uh, commu de facto community centers, outdoor gyms, you know, we spend a lot of time outside. However, um, the type of locations where we have access to in neighborhoods throughout New York is not equal. The quality, the amount, the location. Um, and that's why we felt it was really important, one of the reasons to like reinforce in our mission that you know, nature is a fundamental right. And as such, we strive to make sure that all New Yorkers um, can live that, breathe that, and experience that. That's, that's baked into what we do. I think that's such an important point in a city like New York. I used to live in New York and in a city of apartments, like you're saying, those common spaces are crucial. And you know, I used to live not too far from the Hudson River side of New York in Upper Manhattan. And so you go down the the sort of bike path, the Hudson River Parkway, and that you're right, there are people out there having barbecues. That's their meeting spot on the weekends. Families gather, communities gather. I mean, it's it's more than just a public park in the way that maybe some folks around the world think about it. Like it's it's really it's crucial spaces for people. And I love that NYRP says that its first and foremost mission is environmental justice. And I hadn't thought about it framed that way. And I'd love to hear you maybe speak more about just how NYRP uses green spaces as a tool to encourage more equality and sort of ensure environmental justice for, for different communities in different boroughs around the city of New York. Sure. So at our founding, which was over 25 years ago at this point, you know, our founder, along with the Trust for Public Land, secured 52 lots that would have been over to, likely for development um, by the city. And those lots are generally located in areas throughout all five boroughs that don't necessarily have a, a central park next door or a prospect park nearby, right? So in taking hold of those lots and turning them into green spaces is just like one step in being able to combat, if you will, the inequities that exist in neighborhoods throughout New York. You know, environmental justice can mean different things to different people depending on where they're from, but at its basis is that there's an inequity, right? There's, there's a, a and in some neighborhoods, the inequities are quite jarring. And then others, it's maybe not as obvious. But for us, access to green space, quality green space in neighborhoods that are either over densified or have been neglected or don't have trees, tree canopy, um, these are all forms of environmental injustices. And so our way um, at NYRP of working to respond to that is to ensure that there's more green space, that we continue to distribute trees and plant trees, that neighborhoods that have access to a lot of green space, and there are, understand that that's all neighborhoods were not created equal, and then we need to do something about it. And so NYRP may have, have started in greening spaces and may have originally been considered like a greening organization. And that's true, I mean, we did green spaces, but the core of that was about people and neighborhoods and why that matters. And that's environmental justice. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that the organization sort of just uses green spaces as the tool, but there's there's this sense of this advocation for equality and and equal access to something that is very crucial, again, in a city like New York for all citizens. I love that that's just the organization's tool, but it's not, you know, it's not just focused there. And I think I read as I was preparing to speak to you today that NYRP is sort of unique in the sense that it does relatively equal work in all five boroughs. A lot of sort of nonprofits might focus in one area or, you know, it's really spread across all five boroughs of New York City, which I think is is rare. You know, even though New York City is such a diverse city, not all the resources go equally to each, you know, section of the city, so to speak. And I just think that it's worth calling that out um, and really commendable. And you know, I think as you're already starting to allude to, there's so much more involved here than just the ability to sit in a park. There are implications for food, food, food insecurity and food sovereignty, you know, teaching children gardening practices. Would you speak about some of the kind of outgrowth, if you'll forgive the image there with what we're speaking about within communities, though, and what these spaces mean to them? So you'll you'll so soon learn there's a lot of bad puns with Yeah. <laughs> I'm already like my head is spinning with them. <laughs> I'm gonna try to like <laughs> those. <laughs> yeah, right. Sometimes it's the perfect word. Um so yeah, let's talk about our community gardens a bit. And so I've mentioned there's 52, but remember we also have been building community gardens through our gardens for the city program for over 20 years. And so we have well over 350 different community gardens that we've helped build and then passed off to community groups all throughout the city. And we do about anywhere from 20 to 22 a year, depending, but actually, and the demand is far greater than even our capacity or supply because the the demand for community gardens is so great. So I mention this to say, because community gardens can be mean different things to different people, not just within the communities where we work, but even within the garden members themselves. So we have gardens that are were designed, and, and I'll preface this by saying, we don't go into communities and, and expect that we're the experts. I, we definitely have experts on our team in horticulture, in garden design, in um, capital projects, but only a community member can be the expert of their own neighborhood, right? Like, and for us to go in and assume is that I feel the wrong way and my team feels the wrong way of approaching it. So all these gardens that have been designed have gone through a rigorous community process where we ask, and I I say this, like every neighborhood in New York City is going to tell you they have needs. You could go to the most affluent neighborhoods and (laughs) they're going to say they have needs, right? It's not a needs conversation. It's a conversation about like, well, what's your vision? If you had a magic wand, like what would you want to see in your community, in your neighborhood? And how can this piece of green space help further the goals you want to achieve and that vision, right? So we keep that in mind with our process. We work with the community to build these spaces and we do it so that they have continued ownership in the space Hmm. and that they want to continue with whatever the focus of the garden is. So this kind of setup is for me to explain that some gardens are designed for passive recreation to kind of get away from it all where you can have a quiet space in the midst of a very dense urban environment and you can read a book or sit under a tree or get some shade, right? A lot of neighborhoods don't have a lot of street trees. Um, Mm. And so this allows for a little cooling off in the summer, just some peace of mind. Other gardens that we have are really heavy on urban agriculture. They're filled with beds for planting. And what's also interesting is they often reflect the backgrounds of the gardeners that volunteer there and that garden there. So in some neighborhoods that are heavy uh, Latinx, you might see vegetables grown or certain peppers grown from Latin America or Central America or Mexico. Um, And then in other neighborhoods that might have West Indian populations, you see the culture of those countries and communities reflected in what's grown in the neighborhood garden. So these gardens become they're not just functional. It's not just like mm-hmm. health, time away, mental health. It's also a passing along of tradition, passing yeah. along of language, a, a, a fortification of what I think is so beautiful about New York City is like the, the immigrant experience of coming to a city that is very welcoming and encourages 
diversity and encourages multiculturalism. So it, it boils down, even when you see it in the gardens, like that, mm-hmm. that, that is a way of, of sharing custom and tradition. Some of one gardens, a few of the gardens actually have little, almost like stages built into them where there's programming um, that we work with community folks in different languages and mm-hmm. music. So these green spaces, yes, it's um, about combating, you know, making communities more food secure because we're growing vegetables. But it's it's also reinforcing diversity, reinforcing one's heritage, um, celebrating one's background. And then in some neighborhoods, just place to sit and take a break because the city can be so taxing. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. These gardens have only taken on side um like heightened meaningful mm. if that's if i could pair those two words together during covid because yeah. where would you go but get outside that was it you could get right. outside you're allowed to get outside and so our gardens and our parks because remember we care for two 80 acres worth of parklands in upper manhattan hmm. We, we've seen more attendance just like visibly, just in volumes of people getting out, which is great. That's what we want. But I, I say this all to say, like your original question was like, what's the outgrowth of establishing and maintaining these spaces? It's it's become these like incredible little microcosms of what is so perfect about my hometown. I don't know how else to put it. Just yeah. these gathering centers of everything that makes New York City great. Yeah, I love the shade that you brought to it of the cultural expression and like just like uh, it's a self-expression opportunity, especially maybe for for folks who come from cultures that are so close to the land or maybe there's, you know, there's heirloom plants that they get to share with their families or teach about their culture to their to their kids or to other people in their families because of this opportunity that's been provided for them. I love that aspect of it. I hadn't thought of that. And I also love what you said about just collaborating with the communities to understand what they want out of this what's going to help you reflect yourself what's going to get you bought in and using this and like not to go in and tell them what they're going to get or you know say this is what we think you would want or this is what you need it's like no like help us build this you know we had another guest on our show another new york actually new york city nonprofit um called rethink food which works with local restaurants to donate food to those who might need it and they always go to the communities first to the community centers and say what kind of food do you like and that helps to shape what they do in each neighborhood which I thought was so smart and powerful and it's just what everybody should do. And I love to hear that that's reflected in your all's work as well. Um, You started to speak about another aspect of NYIP, which I'd love to hear you dig into, which is the work you do in some of the New York City parks. And I think, you know, High Bridge and Sherman Creek are on that list in Upper Manhattan. I used to live close to Fort Tryon, which is a gorgeous park. If anyone either in or out of New York has never been, go. Um, And I think, you know, NYRP in its early days did a little bit of cleanup work there in Fort Tryon, which I very much appreciate. But I'd love to hear about what the organization does in in Sherman Creek and High Bridge and uh, how you all collaborate with the city to kind of maintain those spaces. Yeah. So uh, I will agree with you. Fort Tryon is saying the views for, I, I always tell people that visit to New York. If you haven't been to the cloisters, go check out the cloisters. Yeah. I, pro- I, uh, I proposed to my husband on the Linden Terrace of Fort Tryon park. So like that <laughs> spot, well, that view that, that like, I call it a cathedral, like those trees and that those stone, it's such a beautiful park. So. Yeah. Um, NYRP's efforts now are really focused, as you mentioned, in Sherman Creek Park and a good section of High Bridge Park in Upper Manhattan and Inwood. Um, and our work is a little bit different to some degree in both parks. So in High Bridge, High Bridge is, a, is a, quite a large park, and our work in High Bridge is largely concentrated around trees. It's a heavily forested area. Um, and there is a lot of that goes into tree care, into reforestation, into removing invasives, um, and into making sure that access to a lot of the natural paths that run through uh, High Bridge. I mean, you can actually like literally go hike <laughs> if you want yeah. in Upper Manhattan through some of these parks. And so, and talk about views. High Bridge is another park where you have outstanding views. 
And that's like the bulk of our, it's not entirely our work in Highbridge, but that's like a lot of the work is around tree care in Highbridge because there's just so much of it. Um, in Sherman Creek Park, uh, you know, both the work in Highbridge, but especially Sherman Creek Park over our history has been transformational because we've been involved there for about 20 years, a little over 20 years. And that section of Sherman Creek Park, which runs along the Harlem River, right, from in, in Inwood north to south, really interesting because honestly talk about environmental injustice right this is an ej community that's it would be defined as an ej community because that area was filled with tires burnt out cars debris it had fallen in grave blight and disrepair when nyrp got together with the parks department to say we're going to do something about this and that was only 20 years ago, which might sound like a big number, but when you think about it, that's just, I say this to put it in context, that's just two generations, right? Yeah. You and your parents, your parents and your grandparents, like it's not that long ago. So people remember what yeah. the now beautiful park looked like and they remember what they unfortunately did without unfairly yeah. for a really long time, right? And now that we're in Sherman Creek Park and we have a children's garden that produces some, you know, 6,000 pounds of free food for the community a year. Wow. There's paths. Um, there's a restored wetland area. There's, you know, you can actually get up. I mean, this is going to sound crazy, but, and I remember this, there were very few areas in New York City in any of the five boroughs where you could actually get up and close with the water. And I know this because I grew up in Staten Island and, and growing up, you would think you're surrounded by water. You should be able to get to the coastline. You go to the beach, but like there were very few other areas. This was no different. Now you can actually get right up and launch a kayak if you wanted <laughs> off of Sherman Creek Park. It's incredible. There is a, a beautiful project that we've been working on called Living Shoreline. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I've mentioned our our stewardship and care for parks. I've mentioned our gardens and what they do and the the work we do around um, food security in New York City. Um, another area of our work is obviously sustainability. Right. And that's built. It's almost built into everything what we do, but it's it, that we do. But it's worth talking about in some detail because it's so important, right? So the area where the living shoreline is built, and I'm going to try to describe this, but it is along the coast of, or along the, the yeah, the coast side, the water side of Sherman Creek Park. So you're facing the Bronx, okay? Um, you're in Manhattan, but you're facing the Bronx. There's a stretch of area where there, it looks like mud flats. Hmm. And depending on how the tide goes, whether it's tide goes in or out. Um, and it's a busy area because boats go up and down and in and around the Hudson all day long. Okay. Yep. When the tide comes in and out and floodwaters are increasing, and we've had so many major storms in New York city in the last decade, that shoreline is just being eaten away and eaten away and eaten away. And when the shoreline gets eaten away, so do a lot of the natural ecosystems that exist. Um, and, protect and do the jobs they're supposed to do to, you know, taking in the good nutrients, making sure they take out, like it, it affects everything, plant life, animal life, fish, birds that come, et cetera. Yeah. Our restoration work of rebuilding the park to back to what it should be and the living shoreline, which um, if you could picture, picture Jenga horizontally, it's like a bunch I of yeah, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's a bunch of um, they special. They're not concrete, but they look like concrete blocks, almost like a little castle that are connected in a chain parallel to the, the coastline that do what they're supposed to do. As the tide comes in, they block the speed and the entry of the tide so that the area between where the living shoreline is, where that barrier, that natural barrier that's been created by these blocks and the shoreline exists, could start to be highly functioning ecosystems again in the mudflats. Hmm. We've been able to, since this has happened, we've been measuring, we've seen less erosion of the shoreline. We've been able to plant grasses there to kind of bring back some of the natural elements. And more exciting, we're now getting oysters again, like inside, like actual plant life, animal life, pardon me, 
inside the different blocks of the living shoreline, which shows that it's healthy again. It's it's getting there that, you know, so this is like one of the last remaining natural areas um, of the Hudson in, in Manhattan that we thought was really important to protect. And we'd love to be able to expand more. And so if you were to visit Sherman Creek Park today, you could have any number of different experiences. You could on the weekend see that along the Harlem River Greenway are families picnicking on in nice weather, maybe not now in March as it's snowing behind me, but uh, <laughs> picnicking along the Greenway, having parties with their friends, enjoying and socializing. You walk into the park, someone might take a walk along one of the different nature trails or paved trails. In the season, the growing season, the Riley Levins Children's Garden um, is heavily used with different partner organizations um, for food donations, for growth of food, um, both and also education of how things are grown and then food distribution. Um, and then there's areas for passive recreation, access to the waterfront, and now the living shoreline. So you get like some of the best outdoor parks experiences all in a really concentrated area between High Bridge and uh, Sherman Creek Park. It's pretty dramatic. It's so true. And I, I I wonder how many New Yorkers aren't aware of just how much NYRP specifically contributes to these natural spaces. And like you walk through the city and these green spaces, these even par- the small parklets maybe that the NYRP has sort of renovated, so to speak, and brought back to life, the, the empty lots, but then also some of these parks, which are part of the heritage of New York. And like, I think people underestimate the level of nature, especially in Manhattan, because most people who are visiting as tourists stay downtown, even locals don't necessarily make it up to Sherman Creek or High Bridge or Fort Tryon. But like I used to live on the Hudson, as I said, I'd look out my window, you see bald eagles, you see brown eagles, you see red-tailed hawks. There are like thriving ecosystems that really need protection and help. And so doing this kind of work is super powerful because as you were saying, one piece affects the whole. So you rehabilitate a shoreline, you get some natural grasses back in, you know, oysters can grow back and that affects the birds, that affects the other sort of animals in these ecosystems, which are still alive and, you know, very resilient in a city like New York City with everything else that's going on. The fact that these ecosystems can still bounce back and be present. I mean, it just really impacted me as a New Yorker when I was there. And I would really encourage anyone who visits New York to get up to see these spaces and really appreciate the love and care and work that's going into preserving them and kind of regenerating them. It's really worth being there. I'm so glad you said that. Thank you for that. Um, You know, I had two in the last couple of years, like two interesting experiences at Sherman Creek Park that reinforced for me how important parks or nature are and, and that they are coming back. One was I was walking along the water by the living shoreline and I was actually giving a tour or one of our, I was on a tour being given by one of our, um, you know, the head of our parks up there. And we saw boom, out of the, near the water, a raccoon, like a big raccoon, yeah. you know, not like a little one. And, we, and I was stunned. I was like, wow, we have raccoons. And it occurred to me, wait a minute, we have raccoons because now there's life at the shoreline that the raccoons are interested in, right? It's like, she's hmm. be at other species and um, we're protecting what's at the shoreline. But I said, wow, like that came back, right? You know, like that there's new animals and new life there again. It's not tires and it's not cars, debris. It's, it's actual animals. Like, it's just like, you don't think about it. And then another time I was up in Sherman Creek park and I was walking to get somewhere. And in the distance, I heard this guy go, shh. And he looked at me and I was like, Oh, it's a birder. And he had his, and I'm not even sure what he was looking at, but I thought to myself, you know, that the ecosystem is doing well when new species of birds come back and you have birders in your park because they only go to parks to see things that they can't otherwise, you know, their location. So I was like, wow, that's great. Like there must be something special that this guy is looking at. And I also tell people, yeah, you know, people, some people think bees are pests and I could see why people would be nervous about bees. But if we see more bees in and around our gardens, that's a good thing. They are pollinating. We set up a pollinator project just to kind of create, I call it the bee highway, you know, (laughs) get bees to go to the flowers and eventually make it to our gardens where there are vegetables so they can pollinate those flowers. And so we're seeing more and more of this in New York, which really makes me happy. That's really fantastic. I mean, NYRP is such a big piece of that, I think. And something that you 
spoke about just now, I'd love to dig into a little more because you referred to it earlier, but just the power of these green spaces for everybody in New York, no matter who you are throughout the pandemic and throughout kind of times like that, like what, would you speak a little bit more about what you saw take shape as far as, you know, New Yorkers really appreciating green spaces in a new way? I think all of us around the world interacted with nature in kind of a deeper way, which I am so happy about um, throughout the pandemic, but just what you saw, maybe what you even personally experienced during, you know, the last two years and, and how much more people really came to value these spaces and spend time in them. Right. So I, you spend time in New York, so you know this, but for people that are listening or watching that aren't from here or haven't visited here, New York City was not designed to work and live in the same spaces, hmm. right? Like most of us live in very yeah. small. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good point. <laughs> with multiple family members or partners or maybe have multiple roommates. And during lockdown, it was cheek to jowl for <laughs> most New Yorkers. And so we would covet like the, the moments where we could get outside. Like uh, for me personally, the, the walk in the morning to my local bodega when it was open, <laughs> when it could open just to get a coffee. I mean, I could have made coffee at home, right? No, yeah. it, was the, it was the experience of getting out getting some fresh air, having some human interaction. And as the city started to open up more, it was certainly going to parks, taking a walk every day, seeing people. It was a lifting of all the heaviness hmm. in those brief moments that one could be outside in the, in the, I mean, kids are always happy in the playground. Remember playgrounds were closed for a really long time. Yeah. Right? So That's, yeah. I, mention this to say like I'm fortunate I know I'm lucky where I live I have access to green spaces but there's a lot of communities where the only what's counted as open space right could be a neighborhood playground could be a asphalt lot of a schoolyard but it's where kids could go families could go and run around and do things they were closed during COVID so that meant a mom who was stuck at home either working if she could work from home or maybe right. not at all, maybe not working at all and her kids probably young in a very small space might have to take multimodal transportation, a bus and a subway. And not a lot of people were doing that during lockdown or COVID to get to the nearest open space, to get to the nearest green space because much of it had to be closed. And so and in neighborhoods, like the Trust for Public Land did a study on this, that in affluent neighborhoods in New York, there's an average of 14 acres of open space. So that could be parks, like I've said, playgrounds, even recreation centers, waterfronts, but 14 acres where you could get out of your apartment and do something. In less affluent neighborhoods in New York City, it's barely six acres. Hmm. I would argue during COVID, it's, it was probably even half of that because of just what was allowed to be open and not. Yeah. So the importance of these spaces was like, <laughs> you never, you, you started to realize like it, it is, talk about nature being a fundamental, right? Hmm. Like you felt the loss when you couldn't yeah. get outside. And when you did it, you saw, it was like people's shoulders dropped and the, they carried their bodies differently. It was just, there was so much, it was that moment of peace and, and commune. You know, the other times during the pandemic where I feel like New York City also had that sense of commune was that, you know, and again, it was also often getting outside, even if it meant walking outside one's apartment on the street was at 7 p.m. where we would applaud and bang pots and cheer for the emergency and healthcare workers and frontline workers. Well, yeah. I would tell everybody I know, all those parks workers, just like the NYRP staff that have been in those parks and gardens every single day, caring for them, they're frontline workers too, because they're Absolutely. keeping them safe, clean, open. Um, and so those were the moments of commune, like getting together, being outside. And it underscored for me personally, the need to make sure that the communities that were not as fortunate as certainly where, where I live, because I have access to Prospect Park, which is very large in Brooklyn, that communities that don't have access to green space 
how much they were really hurting. Hmm. COVID. Like next level hurting. Um, because it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of mental, putting the health issues aside, like tremendous amount of mental health stress and pressure to be captive, stuck in a small space with multiple people and not a lot of places you have able to go. It was, it was, there was meaningful during, and I, and I keep saying every time I have a chance on my soapbox with elected officials or with decision makers, like if not now, when, if we're not going to invest in our parks as critical city infrastructure, we invest in utilities, we invest in transportation, education, all these other things. If COVID hasn't taught us that open space is critical city infrastructure, I don't know <laughs> what we've learned after all this. Yeah. And, you know, the other piece of this, Nathan, was food production. I will never forget watching the news in April 2020. It was the first week of April. And it was a news reporter in Corona, Queens, capturing the line from a food pantry that went twice around a block. Um, and it was people from all walks of life and backgrounds and ages and languages um, lining up to get whatever kinds of non-perishable goods they could. It, it wasn't even that they were getting leafy green vegetables or any, arguably any kinds of produce that had a shelf life, right? And it kind of clicked for me and, you know, our gardeners were already doing a lot of urban agriculture but we thought for, you know, as an organization, we need to do more. Like this is the time where we really need to encourage our gardening network, give them um, starts. Starts are like, rather than growing something from seed, you would like, a, you'd get a tomato plant that might have a slight bit of growth as opposed to grow from seed. Typically gardeners like to grow from seed because it, it creates a really strong plant. Sometimes if you have a condensed amount of time, and you have to produce things quickly, you might grow from what's called a start. So I say this because we gave away and, and produced for gardeners as many starts on things as we could and said, would you increase production in your garden? Would you give it away in your community? And I'm gonna tell you resoundingly, they were all amenable to this hmm. um, because the need was so great. Yeah, and I think it speaks to sort of a need that NYRP has discovered that I think every urban center could and should benefit from like programs like this should exist across the country, across the world, where there's an organization that can play a nonprofit role so that they really are focused on the interests of the community, but who can also bring together sort of corporate sponsors and, you know, city officials and uh, like city parks organizations. And, you know, I would love to see organizations like NYRP spring up in every major city. And, you know, I wonder if you know, I've asked myself, I wonder if NYRP has explored expanding into other urban centers or if there are organizations who are kind of trying to replicate this work and would love to hear you speak about the implications and the potential for this to sort of like um, grow in other areas. Again, oh, I, I went to a pun again. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's so hard. No, but, um, but, um, but, you know, I really, there's, there's so much potential here and, you know, every city should have an organization like this. Um, well, I'm delighted to hear that. And I, I, I always say if I have my magic wand, right? So we have not, um, our name is New York, our heart is New York, our home is New York. So we are focused in New York City proper. Uh, I, have, I couldn't say what the future might bring, but our, there's so much work that has to be done here, hmm. right, really in our own backyard. So that's where our heads and hearts are at um, and resources right now. There are other cities, while there's no other, let's say, citywide or umbrella organization that I'm aware of that does the sort of multifaceted approach that NYRP does, we are somewhat unique in that way. There are cities, though, that have done really interesting things with their park systems. So, and, and that's not to say that they're not controversial, hmm. right? because there's only limited amounts of way that a government entity can raise funds in order to um, pay for their park system. And so in Philadelphia, they created uh, a couple of years back, actually I've lost two years through COVID. It's probably more than a couple of years back. Um, <laughs> time is different now. <laughs> different. 
um, they created a soda tax uh, where the mayor said, drink more soda. Because if you drank soda, there was a tax on it that then went directly into the park system or to things that supported increasing and improving the park system there. Hmm, Again, that's great. There's controversy on both sides. One could argue both sides, but it did help bring about an improvement to their park system and creating better green space. Um, in other cities, uh, and again, this is pre-COVID because now I think the, the concept of gathering has changed, but in other cities, uh, there was a point at which um, an extra fee was being placed on tickets that one would buy to arenas, for example, for big concerts or sporting events, and that fee would go directly towards supporting the city's park system as infrastructure. In other places, it might be like give a dollar or pay a dollar to park your vehicle if it wasn't an electric vehicle in the parking lot. And so there are creative ways. They're not going to be without their controversies. But I think in order for us as a society to really think greener, we're going to have to a, have some real come to Jesus conversations um, between government, people, and public and private partnerships. Because hmm. from my point of view, that's the only way this is going to work. Like the success of NYRP was, be, uh, you know, has been because public-private partnerships gelled in a way to make us possible, right? So yeah. we have, <clears throat> we're fortunate to have a lot of generous supporters. Part of our inception, like take, for example, our Million Trees Initiative, right? Planting a Million Trees. That was a direct confluence of some of the greatest support between the city of New York and Mayor Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, which continues to be a primary supporter for us, support from elected officials throughout the city to make it happen, and the Parks Department, right? So like you need all those pieces, legs of the stool to make it stable. And I think that's like the example or the takeaway I would tell other cities is don't expect as a nonprofit that you can do this alone. Or conversely, I would say, you know, don't expect as a government entity you can do it alone, right? Because there's so many um, necessities and uh, important things government government needs to direct its resources to, especially in cities that have largely underserved populations where they're looking to provide services. And there's a finite amount of money because you can't continue to just tax. So you're going to have to look for public-private partnerships. And there's good models out there. Yeah. And you said something that I want to call out, which I think is so important. It's like in this world where we're talking about sustainability and environmental conservation and the impacts of those things for climate change, everything up for, to climate change, everything down to food insecurity. It starts with appreciating what we have and growing what we have. And in a time when more people live in cities than any other time in history, I think, how else do kids appreciate these things so that they grow into adults who value the environment? How, if we don't preserve the ecosystems that are there and see what's possible through an organization like NYRP, then you know we miss out on opportunities to understand what our impact could be and can be in cities around the world, which then grows out from there um, as we think about the bigger problems. You know, if we can do these small things, then what can we do on a larger scale based on what we've learned from that? I think that's so important to call out because again, in a city like New York or cities like Chicago, LA, where kids might have limited access to growing something, to seeing something growing and having a relationship with it, that's what causes them to be curious about that, ask questions, be part of the solution when they get old enough to think about it in new ways. And I just think that's an aspect of this, again, that I hadn't thought of, but is really important. Um, hit the nail on the head, like our work is about open space and greening, or one could argue that's like maybe on the surface. When I talk about NYRP, and I think when others think of NYRP, it's about people, <laughs> it's about community, it's about neighborhood, right? That's like at the basis of this. I would also argue when people talk about climate change or talk about sustainability, like often there's this like big top down approach of, well, if we fix this system, if we address that, yeah, but that all boils down to people, yeah, behaviors and choices. You're so and right. Along those lines, like if a child today learns about, is in school and is learning photosynthesis and then is sitting in a garden <laughs> and starts to connect things, like that's a connection that builds 
commune with nature. That's the connection that we're tr- like one of the connections we're trying to build. Like we we really believe in the power of the grassroots community approach. Yeah, I think you're so right. We think so often about governments and corporations as being the leaders, but I think it actually really starts on the ground with us person to person, person to plant, and um, and, and really goes from there. So I think we would be remiss if we don't just talk about briefly, at least the founder of NYRP, who's someone that, you know, my mom would be furious with me if we didn't talk about this, <laughs> because it's uh, it's someone that she's very much in love with. One of my first concerts was seeing uh, the founder of NYRP with my mom when I was young. So um, so I also would love to hear, you know, you speak a bit about the founder and and, and her passion for nature and how that led to the, the establishment of NYRP and, and the, the evolution of it over time. So by our founder, you're referring to uh, Bette Midler, of course. The one and only, the divine Miss The one and only. (laughs) Um, I will tell you, uh, Bette is one of those unique individuals that one meets that I've been lucky enough to meet that puts her heart, her mouth, her resources, her energy, her smarts behind the things she loves. And New York City, nature access to nature are those things that she loves. And, you know, I've, I've asked her a number of times, like, where did this all come from? How did this start? And she also is somebody that, and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain what she told me, but she's also somebody that like, will literally, if she sees trash in a tree pit, she will reach down and pick it up. Like there's no excuses. There's no job too big or too small we all have to care for our city and our planet, like is her approach. And she said that a lot of that, she told me came from her growing up in Hawaii, which a lot, like many people will say, oh, it must've been a lifelong New Yorker. She actually um, spent her formative years in Hawaii. And she explained to me that she grew up with a reverence um, and a respect towards nature. Mm -hmm. And that when she arrived in New York City, she was just sort of, shocked at how our open spaces were treated or in many ways neglected. Sure. And she on her own just started organizing with friends and family to clean up uh, stretches of other, you know, what should have been green space, but were really trash strewn or neglected. Hmm. And then, um, you know, fast forward had this opportunity to, with um, Trust for Public Land, to purchase these lots for which eventually became our gardens and is how we evolved into NYRP. But in my, I will never forget this as long as I live, like in one of my first few weeks of work. Now I will preface this by saying I started um, around February 17th, 18th of 2020, which means three weeks later, the world as we knew it in New York changed. Yeah. During those three weeks, she called me out of the blue and just to say that, um, oh, Lynn, I was I was speaking with a gardener, which which already struck me that she has one on one. It reminded me I knew this, but it reminded me she has one on one relationships with uh, the gardeners like that's hmm. this is not a, a up here to like, talk, you know, un- management. But no, this is a boots on the ground understanding what's going on. And she said, you know, the gardeners in such and such garden. Um, don't want grills anymore. They like the smokers, the barbecue smokers, like which you often see like the big drum smokers. I don't know if you're familiar with them. And like a lot of East Indian communities, it's like where you get the best jerk chicken in Brooklyn. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the big smokers. (laughs) He's like, they want smokers. And I said, okay, bet. Well, we'll figure that out. We'll, We'll change it out. But I hung up thinking like, that's amazing. Like she has 10,000 things she has to do in the, and she took the time to speak with a gardener, call me, make it a priority. And I think that is sort of exemplary of how she created and birthed this organization is she used her voice and love of everything in New York City and nature to make sure that every person in New York City counts. And that that sticks with me a lot, like that she's always asking about communities that I think a lot of decision makers or people in positions of power 
don't ask about necessarily. And she's very in tune and wants to know what can we do? Can we do more? Is, you know, like always, what else can we do? What else can we do? There's there's a can do roll up your sleeves approach that's infused with love, passion, and thankfully, you know, resources to, so that we can get it done. Much much respect, much respect. (laughs) Yeah. That's, really fantastic to hear and I think it speaks to that impulse that you were speaking about earlier where it's like this is not about always the bigger picture it's not just like the zoomed out version of the parks that we've rehabilitated or this or that it's like what do people want to use their community spaces as how do they want to interact with them like that matters like it matters for for the locals and that's what this is about it's not just about the big picture how do we save the world it's like how do we make one person's life better how do we give somebody who didn't have access to something that really means something and can make their life improve improve their quality of life how can we give them that in the form that will resonate with them and yeah it's just really beautiful to hear that that's reflected kind of you know top down so to speak but in this sense it's like it's yeah it is I am incredibly fortunate to, you know, I, I to be at the helm of an organization where not only does every single staff member here eat, sleep, and drink the mission of this organization, like it doesn't matter what you do, there, there is passion behind there, but it's the same hands-on approach with our board of directors. Like they want to hmm. be involved. They want to know what's going on. They, they want more updates instead of less. They want to see the work. They want to see the gardens. They want to meet the gardeners. It's There is, Bed has created an environment here where it's about hands-on doing and involvement. Hmm. And I think that's really important, especially during the pandemic. And now what I hope is the post-pandemic, soon to be post-pandemic time in New York City, when many have fled the city. Yeah. And we're like, no, bring it back. Yeah. Make it thrive again support the communities that were hit the hardest. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, um, I I wish that we all would have such an experience to be involved with an organization where we can get our hands in the clay, you know, in that way and really see the impact that we're having and and really, you know, I I really wish that experience for everyone. I, I would love to see this become the time of like the activist, the active, the, you know, we can solve these problems. We've just got to get in there and do it. And we got to care enough to, to listen to each other and do it in the right way. And so much can come from that. Um, and, and just my final question, I just want to ask, how can people support NYRP? How can they get involved locally if they're New Yorkers or in the New York area? And how can they support from afar, whatever that might mean? Sure. So um, as with most organizations, there's a lot that one can do uh, using social media or being online. Like, Definitely look us up online. It's nyrp.org. And if someone would like to be generous with uh, resources, they can donate there. If they would like to be generous with time, they can find out about volunteer opportunities. There are links to all of our different social media accounts. Certainly follow us, get engaged, share what we're doing. We're really excited because um, we are bringing back our tree giveaway program again. So the more that things can be amplified, uh, the power of social media. I think we we're still just scratching the surface in many ways. And so definitely follow us, share with a family and friend. Um, you know, that, 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 that would be the best and most immediate way, especially if, if someone's not in New York anymore. Absolutely. If you live in New York, if you're visiting New York, go to nyrp.org, look at the green spaces that they are connected to and visit them, you know, go appreciate them, see this work and, and be part of it. Cause it's, it's really worth supporting. And again, I would love to see programs like this, just take shape in every major urban center, especially in the U S but you know, around the world would be amazing. So thanks so much, Lynn. Thanks for everything that you're doing in the organization. It's um, been such a pleasure speaking with you and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I really appreciate you thinking of MYRP. I'm I'm excited. Thank you. You know what I can't stop thinking about after my conversation with Lynn with New York Restoration Project? Nature is human nature. We hear so often that self-destructive tendencies and violence and short-sightedness are human nature, but I disagree completely. 
I believe that the things we truly have in common as humans are much more constructive, compassionate, and life-affirming than any of these outdated stories we've been hearing for so long from the news, from the media, from movies and music and television, as though humans are just doomed to be self-serving, short-sighted, destructive. I don't believe that's our true nature. A part of us feels at peace in nature because we're connected to it, maybe on a level that's not conscious. It's just part of being alive on this planet with other living things. We get quiet when looking at a beautiful sunset or standing in front of a landscape that looks like something out of a painting because a part of us recognizes that beauty on some kind of deeper level. We come from the earth just like all the plants and mountains and trees and animals and it's not only in our best interest but I think, maybe, it's a part of our innate wiring to connect with nature. If that's all true, then a part of us is not allowed to express itself when we're separate from natural places, when we don't have access to them. It's almost like we lose a piece of who we are. That's what I believe NYRP is trying to disrupt, trying to make happen less and less. That lack. When I was a kid, I had a garden in my backyard. I was probably around eight or nine when I got the idea to start growing fruits and vegetables from seeds in the ground at home. And I'll never forget the experience of planting and caring for those seeds. Watching the first leaves spring up out of the soil, which is still my favorite part of spring. And then watching as throughout the summer, that little seedling that I planted becomes a stalk of corn or a huge watermelon or a cucumber, which I had placed in the soil and cared for. Every child, every person should have the chance to connect with nature in this way, to experience what happens when we give to the earth and care for it, and what happens when she gives back. As Lynn shared with us, green spaces are more than just a novelty or a means to an end. It goes way beyond growing food just for practical reasons or planting trees to combat carbon emissions, for example, although these are, of course, very important. Green spaces and gardens are a means of connecting with and passing on pieces of who we are, as Lynn said. Our cultures, our language, our connection to our food, our connection to where we came from. They are places to create memories, to relax, to build relationships with each other, to reconnect with ourselves. They are places to remember our place on this planet and our role, if we choose to accept it, as caretakers. And, as we said at the beginning of today's episode, what we value, what we recognize as valuable, what we're connected to, we will honor and protect. We will not take these things for granted or allow others to destroy what we've built, what we treasure. Which is our first takeaway for today. The three ideas that we explore after every interview to change our world for the better. Our three change makers. Change maker number one, we won't protect what we don't value, what we can't see what we don't experience. There's a beautiful quote that I love from Rachel Carson, the hugely influential biologist, activist, and author whose book Silent Spring basically created the environmental movement in the Western world in the 20th century. Rachel Carson wrote, the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. Destructive behavior is learned, I think. It's not natural. We learn to destroy and exploit, because those are the examples we're given. We think that's what it takes to survive. And we don't always value or protect what we have already, what's given to us freely, because we've become so wrapped up in this idea of building wealth or building power or amassing some kind of fortune of resources or finances. We also become so disconnected from the natural world around us due to how we live in our daily lives that we don't realize what we're losing. We get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, with more and more people living in large cities, where it's easy to forget how the apples we buy at the grocery store got there, how the seeds, the farmers, the bees, the sun, and the elements of the earth worked together to create and produce that apple. If we can remember to focus more on the wonder that Rachel Carson speaks about in that quote, and recognize the importance of the natural world and what it can offer to us, I think we'll begin to act from an understanding of what it truly means to be part of the community of life that we belong to on this earth, whether we recognize it or not. And organizations like NYRP are ensuring that more and more of us have the opportunity to build and appreciate this relationship with nature and the natural world so that we begin to remember our true selves, our true place in the world. Imagine if every city had a group like NYRP, 
protecting and restoring ecosystems, bringing life back to empty lots, creating community spaces and gardens, and connecting citizens with the nature that's available to them even within cities. And imagine if more people were aware of these groups and supported their work and got involved. How would that change our relationship to nature over time, do you think? It's a pretty exciting idea, if you ask me. Changemaker number two. The best way to make change is to get our hands in the dirt and get involved. I'm so inspired by the story that Lynn shared with us about Bette Midler's example when it comes to how she relates to NYRP and the work that they do. Bette has every excuse to stay in her lofty position as the celebrity founder, responsible for raising money and kind of, you know, being famous, spreading the word. Bette is busy. She's in demand. She's a globally well-known performer and personality, yet she stays close to this project, which she created and cares about and cares for. She literally gets her hands dirty by picking up trash around New York, as Lynn mentioned. I don't know Bette personally, obviously, but I would imagine that she would say she wouldn't have it any other way. When making positive change is something we get close to, it takes on more meaning. This is something we've explored in past episodes. I fully support signing online petitions and making donations, amplifying important stories and messages on social media, and taking in books, films, and other stories that educate and empower us. But there's something to be said about actually building something yourself, actually making physical contact, getting involved, getting out there and planting a tree, or volunteering for a nonprofit you believe in, whatever that nonprofit focuses on. In my experience, what I've learned is that your connection to whatever cause you're focused on deepens in a big way when you get involved directly. Bet, like so many of our other guests, is one person who took a vision and gave it life. Yes, Bet has resources and relationships that helped her do what she's done with MYRP, but that doesn't mean it was easy or simple or that it didn't take time to gain momentum. Many of our past guests were not celebrities when they started. Some of them still aren't. But they got their hands dirty anyway. They got started. They took action. They saw our problem and decided to become part of the solution or to build one themselves in many cases. Imagine if a thousand of us did the same, chose the idea or project that inspires us the most, and took direct action to bring it to life. That doesn't necessarily mean starting a nonprofit or a mission-driven company like many of our past guests or changing your life path at all. But it might mean committing to regular volunteering for your favorite cause, starting a blog or a podcast like this one, like I did, to talk about ideas that inspire you, that you're passionate about, that you think would bring some kind of positive contribution to people or the earth. Maybe you post more frequently on social media about issues that you care about. If more of us become catalysts and conversation starters focused on positive change, this world will transform. It's just the natural next step. And changemaker number three. It's time to prioritize what truly matters. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's to value the most important aspects of our lives that we often take for granted. Don't you think? When we have to stay physically away from friends and family, it causes us to appreciate the opportunity to spend time together so much more. When we can't go to a cafe or visit our favorite restaurant, those places become even more precious to us when we can visit again. Seeing a concert, seeing live music, watching live sports, going to school. These are all things we experience now in a new way, with more gratitude, hopefully, more appreciation. As we reflect on what matters to us in the wake of the challenges of the last two years, let's make sure that nature and green spaces stay toward the top of the list. Those places that got us through the toughest moments, that gave us somewhere to go when everything else was off limits. In large cities or suburban areas, we can easily lose touch with the link that we have with nature. We forget that the tomato we just bought or the pasta we're eating came from plants that need care and resources to grow. That bees and worms and birds and farmers all play a role in providing that food to us. Let's remember how important our relationships to nature and to the earth are, and let's prioritize caring for them. We can take inspiration from NYRP and support them in their mission, or support other organizations who are doing similar work to value, preserve, and restore natural spaces for the benefit of the community, to keep reminding ourselves and others of all that those spaces give to us. Here's what you can do to get involved today. Choose to support your local green spaces. Get to know them. Do what you can to grow awareness and appreciation of them. 
get out into them if you don't regularly. If you live in New York City, you can volunteer with NYRP or the New York Parks Department via volunteer groups like New York Cares for the Parks Department to get to know the city's green spaces and parks better. I used to volunteer in Fort Tryon Park when I lived nearby. I would help with landscaping and picking up trash, cleaning and greening, and I loved spending time outside, pulling weeds, giving back to the park I loved during the summer months. No matter where you are, find ways to give back to the green spaces, community gardens, and parks in your local area. Don't just take them for granted or pass them by without a thought. You'll appreciate them so much more when you have a direct relationship with them, when there's give and take that's conscious. Then invite others to join you or bring them to your newly discovered favorite spots in those areas to spread the appreciation and enjoyment that you've discovered around. Valuing our natural areas will lead to greater appreciation of nature itself, which will only benefit us and the earth from a broader perspective more and more. Here's our challenge for you today, inspired by today's guest. We're calling today's The Green Challenge. Offer something to your favorite green space in the form of a donation, volunteer time, appreciation of it publicly, or care for it in some way. Pick up some trash every time you're there. Give back to nature. If you don't have a favorite green space in your local area, then go find one. There's got to be one not too far away, hopefully. Or if there's not, create one. Start a windowsill garden. Even just growing some herbs or flowers is something. Support a natural space that you've visited that you've loved, or that you've always wanted to visit, like a national park or a state park. I try to give regularly to my favorite place on Earth, the Redwood National Park in Northern California, to support the restoration and conservation work there. Giving back to a place you appreciate forms a new relationship with it. You're no longer just seeing it as a nice place to walk or spend time, appreciating it kind of on a surface level. You're now part of its story, part of what's keeping it alive and thriving, part of what will ensure others after you get to enjoy it. And that's powerful. Let's build that understanding into our relationship with the entire natural world, that we play a role in relationship to it and give back as much as we can in whatever ways we can, because really everything we have was given by nature to begin with. Even the synthetic materials in our lives came from nature originally. Literally everything we have we received from the earth in some way. Let's recognize that and do what we can to return the favor. If you'd like to learn more about our guests today or support them, jump onto nyrp.org to learn more about the work that they're doing around all five boroughs of New York City. Get inspired and consider how you can emulate their work in your town or city or partner with similar organizations where you are. If you're a New Yorker, consider volunteering with NYRP. Donating supports the work that NYRP does in communities and parks and to transform abandoned city lots into havens of peace and calm within the city. Recently, NYRP resumed their Tree Giveaway Program, which is an amazing community program that I was reading about, which is giving away over 2,000 native species trees to anyone in New York who signs up to receive one. They just get one for free, which can be planted wherever they like, bringing more green and more life to homes all around New York City. Your donations support programs like this one. You can also, of course, amplify the NYRP message and mission by sharing it with others via social media or word of mouth. Follow NYRP on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn to get inspiration from their work on the regular, on your feeds. I don't know about you, but I'm humbled by the experiences of the last two years. I really am. I'm ready to move on from it, no doubt, but... I'm not ready to forget some of what I've learned about the value of sharing space with others or the value of listening to others and hearing them out whether we agree with them or not. I learned how important my relationships to family and friends and even strangers are to me. And I also learned how much I value nature in a new way and all that it provides for us. Nature saved me while living in New York and nature is still saving me regularly offering so much and expecting so little in return. Let's do what I think of as the bare minimum and care for the spaces and ecosystems which care so well for us. Let's care for ourselves and each other with fierceness and with all of the earnestness that we did during the pandemic. And let's do the same for the natural world so that we have even more to enjoy and appreciate the next time we're humbled by circumstances, by life, by global events, and reminded of what really matters beyond our busy day to day. Before we get back too quickly to the hustle and bustle, let's remember what it was like to slow down and what we learned. Thanks so much for being here. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, please share. Give us a rating or a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts especially or any other platform which helps to amplify the message of our show and tell the stories of our inspiring guests. Tune in for our upcoming episodes, including a conversation with Sea Shepherd, the hugely impactful direct action, ocean protection and conservation organization who are thought of as the pirates of conservation. Tune in to learn why, what they're doing, and why it matters. Until then, be well. And remember, true change starts with us. So let's start 